Well, I'm thankful that we're all here today, just having a time of worship, opening up the Word together. I pray that um, you leave that much more uplifted than when you came in this morning. And uh, welcoming all those who are watching online as well. Um, if you're here for the first time, we're in the uh, midst of a series on an Old Testament book called the Book of Isaiah. We kind of picked this book because it has um, a lot of parallels with where we're living today in uh, our current culture. Um, Isaiah was experiencing, as a, as a nation, they were um, experiencing some inner turmoil. There was a sense of division that really was uh, even more drastic in its day, but there was a, a unified kingdom that was now broken. There was a northern and a southern part of this kingdom, and they really separated themselves. This is family, just having a huge, you know, uh, disagreement. And now you have 10 tribes of the 12 of Israel that are living in this northern kingdom and two of the tribes living in a southern kingdom. There was a lot of social injustice. There was all kinds of, um, you know, just uh, rebellion that took place. Uh, Isaiah writes in his book of all kinds of harm that were being done to neighbor against neighbor. The broader context finds that the surrounding nations were also beginning to gain more and more power and influence over the region, so much so that Assyria is going to come and it really is going to wipe out the better part of that world around the Mediterranean. It'll go from all the way from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Persian Gulf, and it will just annihilate everyone in between. So there is this threat from without, there's a threat from within, and people are trying to find a glimpse of hope in the midst of all of that. And so that's, that's where we have been. And so I, um, as I was thinking about how to introduce this sermon uh, today, I remembered a, an old uh, novel that uh, was written by a guy named Douglas Copeland. And the, the novel was written, uh, it was called Girlfriend in a Coma. And it was a story about this woman named Karen who in 1979 falls into a coma. And while she lies in, hosp in the hospital, life just continues to move on, right? Her teenage friends, they grow up, they get married, some of them get divorced, some of them do drugs. And in her vegetative state, Karen misses some really big world events. She misses the fall of the Berlin Wall, the AIDS crisis, the ubiquitous personal computer, and everything that comes along with it. 17 years after collapsing, Karen suddenly awakes from this dreamless sleep. Her sudden reawakening is now a huge story. People are clamoring together to find out, you know, hey, what, what's, you know, how are you looking at the world now? What, what, uh, what are some of the big questions that you have, to, uh, you know, that you're, you know, contemplating now? And so at first, she uh, kind of put everybody off, and she really didn't want to do any of these big interviews. And then she kind of relented. And so this newscaster uh, uh, interviews her and says, what's the biggest change in the world that you've noticed so far, Karen? What strikes you as the deepest change? And she says, you know what it is, Gloria? It's how confident everyone comes across these days. Everyone looks like they're raring to go all the time. People look confident whether they're buying chewing gum or walking the dog. And so she says, so you like that then? She goes, well, but there's more. You take the same confident looking people and ask them a few key questions and suddenly you realize that they're despairing about the world. That the confidence is really a mask. And so Gloria was taken back. She says, well, what kind of questions do you mean? He says, well, questions like, what do you think your life is going to look like in 10 years? Are you straining to find some kind of meaning? Are you afraid of growing old? You know, those are all kinds of questions that all of a sudden bring us to a place where we recognize the limits of our own personal control, right? And depending on our personalities and, and backgrounds, that can kind of tip the scale where we become a little bit more anxious about the world that's, that, that we're a part of. And that's exactly what we find with the book of Isaiah. 
In a very real way, the story of Isaiah is about a culture looking for meaning as well. Let me give you a little bit of a, uh, a flyby into the book as we look at some of the passages that I want to talk to you about today. Some of the highlights that we learned is, I have already mentioned, Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, is now you know, in a um, broken relationship with its brother to the north. That rebellion has come on various levels, not only in the way in which politically they have become aligned, but socioeconomically, politically, everything is just really seeing to deteriorate. And you open up the book and Isaiah is saying that God has seen all this and that judgment is going to come. There is this invasion that is predicted of the Assyrian Empire that will not only devastate the northern kingdom totally, you'll never hear from them again, but it was also going to come and it will also just wreak havoc on the kingdom of Judah as well. Isaiah becomes a picture then of one who is now trying to, for himself to find some sense of meaning and trying to find how his faith and God's will in this world, how they all just like collide together because it seems like everything is fraying at the edge. There's a famous passage that we read about in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah goes into the throne room of God and is completely overwhelmed by this image of God high and lifted up. And it becomes apparent that he doesn't really belong here. But God comes and cleanses him and redeems him. And we're given a picture in that scene of what it takes to stand in the very presence of God. And that's a, a humble spirit. You turn the page, and the very next chapter, we're introduced to the king of Judah. His name is Ahaz. Ahaz's problem is that he no longer believes at all. In fact, he's looking for all kinds of alliances to shore up his country right now. Only God confronts Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah, and he says to King Ahaz, he says, look, ask me for a sign. I'm telling you, you don't have to worry about this Assyrian empire. It really is not going to um, encroach upon Jerusalem. But you got to trust me on this one. He says, in fact, why don't you just ask me for a sign, and the sky's the limit. You could ask whatever you want. And Ahaz feigns this sense of humility, says, no, no, it's all right. I don't want to put God to the test. But God knows what he's doing. He God never asks a question that he doesn't know the answer to. And the answer that was really forthcoming is that Ahaz already had begun to build all kinds of alliances with the very nation that was invading them, Assyria. And that wasn't going to go well. And so what God does in this book then is begin to say, okay, now that you rejected me, let, let me tell you the signs that I'm going to give so that you know that I mean what I say. And one of those signs is the sign of Emmanuel. Now, here is a Christmas card cover, right, that we're going to be receiving here pretty soon. It's going to have that text from Isaiah chapter 7 that says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with the child and will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel. That text that we read about in, during our little Christmas seasons is God's way of saying to the people around them that what I am going to do is going to unfold as the years of this child increase. So while he is young, I am telling you that before he stops eating, you know, curds and honey, you know, um, just baby food, the Assyrians are going to come down from the north, and they're going to wipe out the northern kingdom. When that child reaches the age of where he knows right and wrong, that kingdom now is going to come and encircle all of Judah. And so this was a sign 
meant to those who were remaining faithful, to this remnant that would, were still holding on to their faith, that God was with them, that he would protect them even in the midst of all of this calamity. But there was another sign. You know this sign too. It's from Isaiah chapter 9. You get this on your Christmas cards as well, where it says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God was saying that in the midst of all of these nations and kings who are clamoring for power and control, there's going to come a day that there will be a son that is given, and all of the attributes that are attributed to him can only be found in God himself. This is going to be God's son that he sends into the world to be this redeemer, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. And that too was then meant to give this sense of hope to people who are living in very hopeless situations. But it goes even further. In chapter 11, if you were here on this particular Sunday, we handed out these little um, keychain tags. There's a picture of a stump with this branch growing out from its roots and beginning to, to, to flower. It was a symbol that God said to the people, even though it appears as if Judah has been cut down as an oak tree that leaves a stump, from this stump, I'm going to erect, uh, uh, grow this branch, and this branch will provide security and refuge to all those who trust in me. That righteous branch, as the, book, as the book continues and as we begin to read in other places in the Old Testament and New Testament, this branch is a metaphor for Jesus. This righteous branch that grows from the stump, from what looks like it's dead. Because God could do that. God raises the dead. And so consequently, all of these were signs to give people in a, in a political and a cultural environment that they just felt so oppressed. God says, I'm not leaving you. But I cannot stand to live in a world where evil is not judged and righteousness is not repaid. I, I've said that a number of times during this series because who wants to live in a world where evil is no longer judged? Anybody want to live in that kind of world where people just do whatever they want, get away with it, and there's no recompense? And how about doing the right thing? Don't you like to, to, to have this sense that if I do the right things, that I will be blessed for that, that somewhere, somehow, someone's going to take notice, and, and I, I will be blessed because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the heart that I have towards God and uh, love that I have towards people. And that's all that God is doing. What God is doing is saying, look, basically, look, I have given a standard by which I call righteous. And everybody has chosen their own way. They've done their own thing. And the consequence of that is a deterioration at the very foundation of a culture that now everyone is just looking out for themselves. And we forgot even how we can live with a modicum of civility. So all of these were signs that were being given. And now we're given a picture, we were given a picture of where all this was headed. In Isaiah chapter 25, we saw this grand picture where God says, let me tell you eventually where all this is going to lead. It's going to lead to a place where judgment will befall evil, and it will be eradicated. There's going to come a kingdom where it says righteousness will prevail, where the whole order of things will be turned upside down. The hostilities that exist sometimes within, um, within our, our, our very uh, environment, you know, uh, now he says in this environment, even the lion will lay down with the lamb. There will be no more of this hatred or jealousy or anger, and it, it will all be removed. 
We'll be given a new heart. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. There will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. And even to us in 2019, man, it, it feels kind of good that God says one day he's going to fix all that is broken. And so this is where it leads us today. And after having said all of these things, God is now about to give us a picture of how all of this works itself out in an individual who is the son of King Ahaz. So Ahaz was this faithless king over Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. And now God, from his own line, raises up another son, and that son's name is Hezekiah. Hezekiah is about 25 years old when he becomes king over Judah. He's also going to reign for 29 years, so he's going to have a long run. And in that run, there are some significant things that happen in the life of this Hezekiah that fits our story today. So I just want you to relax for a moment and just listen to this story as God unfolds it, because there are some things that I think are really necessary for us to, um, to get a good sense of um, where our confidence really ought to be found. When Hezekiah becomes king, he becomes king in an environment that's very toxic. And he recognizes that most of that toxicity, it really finds its root in the fact that people have neglected to follow God and his ways. The call of God on a person's life to treat their neighbor as themselves has gone out the window. That golden rule has now been replaced to he who has the gold rules. And so I, Hezekiah recognizes that as a country, they needed to repent. And so for the first four years, that's what filled Hezekiah's heart. In fact, there's this text in one of the historical books in the Old Testament called Kings. It says uh, this about Hezekiah. It says, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook, and he even rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Which is a big thing because even the northern kingdom was trying to make an alliance, and all that began to deteriorate. Hezekiah's father was sneaking around trying to, you know, uh, buddy up to Assyria, but Hezekiah would have none of it. He spent the first four years of his reign purging the land of Israel's rejection of God's rule. In fact, one of the reasons for the separation between the, uh, these brothers was that they had set up alternate, you know, places of worship that completely disregarded everything God had given them within those Ten Commandments that Moses had given. Everything that Moses instructed to them, that northern kingdom completely just ignored. Under Hezekiah, though, he turns around and he sends an invitation back to some of those who are still living in exile in this northern kingdom and says, why don't we just, why don't we just stop this madness? We haven't celebrated Passover together, that one momentous sign where God took Israel out of the clutches of, of uh, Egypt's taskmasters, set them free with all kinds of miracles and wonders. He says, it was something that bound us together. This was the God who was our God who walked with us out of that wilderness and brought us into a promised land. But we have even celebrated that together as a whole family again. So why don't you come down again to Jerusalem? And they did. 
And for the very first time, these people gathered together for worship, and they said they sang and they danced. In fact, they even increased their celebration for a whole nother week. And it was awesome. It's amazing what one leader could do to, cur- to turn the whole course of a nation. So while he was doing all of this, though, 14 years later, the king of Assyria, whose name is Sennacherib, he attacks all of the fortified cities of Judah and captures them. It was something that God already had prophesied, but God had said that he would not take Jerusalem at this time. The king of Assyria then sent his field commander with a large army to King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. The commander stops at this aqueduct on the road to a field called the Washerman's Field that was really the water supply for the whole town. It was a very strategic place because if you're going to fight a war, you need water. So they, this envoy is sent And he meets with some of the high officials in Hezekiah's court. And um, if you look to your sermon notes now, the rest of what I'd like to talk to you today is kind of found in that passage. The field commander comes to them and he says, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says, on what are you basing this confidence of yours? That's a great statement. That's one that I want you to think about in the remainder of our story today. Where lies your confidence in this life? It could be in position. It could be in our economic status. It could be on our wisdom. It could even be on God. But if we say that our confidence lies on God, it has to be more than just simply something that we just say with the lips because it sounds like the appropriate answer. Because everything else about our life is belying the truth that we really don't rely on God, we rely on everything else but Him. And so ultimately the sense of confidence, even if we say it's in God, the the question then really is, then who is this God that you have put your confidence in? And this story that follows offers us a wonderful case study. It, it, it's, it's sometimes the criticism that I, I, I receive when I talk to people about the scriptures is they'll say, you know, Pastor, it's just that <laughs> these stories, man, they're so old. I mean, like you talk about people like Sennacherib and Hezekiah, I mean, like, All these names are so far, and the places are so far, and it's so far away. Like, what in the world does that have to do with 2019? And I kind of smile because are we not all products of our environment? The seeds that have been planted way before, do they not grow and produce a fruit even in our life? Can anyone that's sitting here say that they are completely oblivious to the history that lies in your own DNA? What I really want to, what, what I usually say to them is, here, here's the one constant, though. The one constant is the heart of man. It never changes. And so if you look back and can learn something from these men and women who live these lives and see how God interacted with them, it shouldn't be so hard to take those lessons then and begin to bring them forward because God remains the same, he doesn't change. And what he's really asking us to do is to recognize why we need him and how in finding him, there is a peace that comes upon a person's life. So it's really not just about Hezekiah, it's about what in this situation is beginning to teach us more and more about this God that we serve. So having said that, the taunt continues from this field commander. He he just basically says, what are you basing this confidence of yours on? Well, this is the text that follows. He says, 
You say you have strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. Well, why does he say that? Because, see, one of the things that you could put your confidence in is this idea that you have superior strategies, that you have a superior military might. Back in another historical book of the Old Testament, a book called Chronicles, I want you to, I want you to read something about what Hezekiah has done during his reign. It says, when, when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, had come and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. A large force of men assembled, and they blocked all the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. And then they worked hard repairing all the broken sections of their walls and towers. They built walls outside and reinforced them. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate and then encouraged them with these words. Hezekiah told them, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah the king of Judah said. So this field commander is correct. He's, you know, his intelligence, you know, uh, came back true. Hezekiah was going out there with a strategy. Hezekiah was strengthening his military forces. But Hezekiah was under no delusion that his army was all that's needed to build, uh, to defeat Assyria. He saw that at the base, his strength really came from them walking in union with God. That's why the first thing he did was try to bring a reformation of the heart before he was going to do that to the military. But this field commander continues his taunt. He says this, he says, on whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look now, you're depending on Egypt that splintered reed of a staff which pierces a man's hand and wounds him as if he le when he leans on it, such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. Again, it didn't pass the notice of the king of Assyria that somehow Hezekiah was trying to align himself with the war machine of Egypt. And it didn't pass God's notice either. In the 31st chapter, this is what God says. He says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. See, this is the God of heaven and earth who holds all the nations in his hands, and he's saying, like, your confidence shouldn't be in the alliances that you make. And your confidence shouldn't lie in your strategies or your military strength. No, it, it needs to go much deeper than that. But the taunt continues. He says this. He says, if you say to me, we're depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed? saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar? You see, what Hezekiah um, did in his first four years, as I shared, is that he broke down all of the trappings of this false religion that they were being exposed to. He tried to bring people back to an understanding of the God that Moses represented to them, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who did deliver them from Egypt and did so many other miracles through people like uh, Joshua and the like. But to the king of Assyria, all he saw that what Hezekiah was doing in breaking down all of these false altars and everything was really just playing checkers with the gods that they served. 
And he's saying, don't say to me that you're going to rely on the Lord your God. Because look what your own king is doing. He's destroying his homes. Not recognizing that what Hezekiah was doing was trying to bring a faithfulness back into the nation. But to the outside world, they look at your attempts to be faithful to this God as saying, come on, so you pick this God, this guy has this God. They're all the same. No, they're not all the same. Hezekiah's faithfulness is, in, is misunderstood by the world, and so is your faithfulness sometimes. People say, why do you worry about all these things for? Why don't you just get along? Why don't you just, do, you know, what, what does it really matter? It matters. And God says it matters. And he is paying attention. So the taunt goes on and says, come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can have riders on them. And furthermore, I have come to attack and destroy this land. And he says, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Well, there is truth to that. Because of the rebellion that lived in the land, God said that they had reached a point, despite all of his trying to coax them back into a place of faithfulness, God says it is time for judgment to be meted out against all of this rebellion. So it is true that God allowed Assyria to become this rod of discipline. But when he uses it as a taunt, he misunderstands God's ways because God was also clear. <laughs> you know how you get a turtle and if it feels threatened, it sticks its head in its shell, right? And every once in a while, that turtle will stick its head out. God says that's like Assyria. They think they're all protected, but the minute they stick out their head, I'm going to cut it off. And he does. And history shows it to be so. So from this commander's viewpoint, what he's basically arguing is that the only confidence that you should have, really, is in the superior power of Assyria. Don't think about your strategies or your military. Don't try to make any kind of alliances. And certainly don't put your faith in a god who obviously isn't really happy with you anyway. Your only saving grace is us. Look at uh, chapter 36, verse 14. He says, he goes on, he says, don't listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me, come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? That's pretty bold. And he's bold because he's had a string of victories. Assyria marches and people begin to tremble. But come on, have we not seeing how history repeats itself over and over. You think you're such a big dog until all of a sudden a bigger dog shows up. He's writing a check that he cannot cash. There is an overestimation of the extent of his power. And by, may I say, there is an underestimation of God's will and power. So he misunderstood all these victories as if they were going to go on forever. He didn't realize that the moment God had used the Syria to accomplish his purposes, they too would be made to pay. Verse 9 and 11. Now Sennacherib sent messengers himself, right, to Hezekiah with this word. Say to, the, to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. 
That's what God told Hezekiah. That's what Hezekiah is banking on and trusting on. And now the king of Assyria is coming along and casting doubts into the mind of Hezekiah. He tried to do it to the people. Now he's doing it to Hezekiah saying, come on, God didn't really mean that. Don't take that to be so truthful. Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? So not only is there doubt, but there is a sense of fear. See, this is why I say to you, like, what are we talking about? Are we talking about back in Hezekiah's day or are we talking about in our day? Because all that's happening here is the very foundations of where people can find their confidence. God is rattling the cage and saying, yeah, that's not a really good, safe, secure place. And whatever it is, you know how that works. You could be, you could have, you could really be on easy street right now. And all it takes is a couple of events to turn your world upside down. It could be an interpersonal squabble with someone that really has your heart. And then all of a sudden now, all the stuff that you have, it doesn't matter, man, because there's no peace inside. Or someone you love gets sick. Or something happens at your job. It, everything was so perfect. And then you get a new boss. The dynamics change. And what seemed to be like so easy, now all of a sudden, it becomes such a strain. But you think, man, I got my strategy for success. I, I know where I'm headed. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm confident. Well, that confidence could be shaken in a moment over things that you have absolutely no control over. That's the lesson. That's what Hezekiah is beginning to understand. All this barking from Assyria he, and uh, everything trying to, to um, cause him to be less secure in this relationship with God is God's way of just testing Hezekiah and saying, okay, dude, are you going to trust me or not? Your father didn't. How about you? Well, listen to this last prayer then. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, and then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. This is in your notes. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. And let's look at this prayer. You can learn a lot about what people believe, think. You can learn a lot about what people believe listening to their prayers. O oh Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You see that? For Hezekiah, he understands Assyria isn't the one who is God over all the kingdoms of the earth. The God of Israel is the God over all the nations of the earth. He weighs them in his own hands. He is sovereign. That's who God is. He goes on and says, you have made heaven and earth. Not only is God sovereign, but God is creator. All things have been made by him, and all things hold together by him. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. You see that? This God who is sovereign, this God who is creator, is also a living God. He's not a dead God of wood and stone. He's a living God who is present, who is able to show a sense of awareness, who is open to the cries of his people. God is one who says, I will draw near to you. You want to know who God is? Listen to verse 18. It says, It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. He doesn't have, his, he doesn't have these rose-colored glasses on. He sees life the way it is. He recognizes, hey, Assyria is causing some big trouble. And he says, They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. But they were not gods. 
but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Hezekiah has a way to understand what is true and what is false. Just because somebody erects a statue and says, hey, I'm going to pray to this, doesn't mean that that statue has any power to be exercised over a person's life. But the sovereign God, the creator God, the living God, he does. And that's why he ends his prayer here in verse 20. Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Because he is able to deliver. And that's exactly what happened. God put a hedge around a series of assaults, and they would not overcome Jerusalem. So you would think, man, this is all good now, man. We got the king that we've been waiting for. Well, yes and no. Because Hezekiah is going to show that he has feet of clay just like you and me. God would bring another test into Hezekiah's life. The Bible will tell you that he got sick to the point of death. And God was like, okay, are you going to still trust me? And Hezekiah prays on his deathbed and God delivers him. But with all of that, it says that Hezekiah became a little bit prideful. It's hard not to do. People are coming now into the city of Jerusalem. They've seen what God did on their behalf. They saw how Assyria was really given a stiff arm. And now even envoys from Babylon begin to come and they want a meeting with Hezekiah to just understand, man, what did you do? How, how did you manage all of this? And you know what Hezekiah does? He's like with his chest out. He goes, hey, let me show you a little bit about my kingdom. And he starts showing them all around saying, hey, look, look at the expanse of this place. Look at my weaponry. Look at the silver and the gold. And he takes them in and he shows them everything. Isaiah the prophet is standing by and he says to him, he says, who were those people that came? He says, oh, well, they were envoys of Babylon. They, they just wanted to talk to me. And he says, and what did you do? He says, I showed them all the treasures of my palace. He says, you showed them everything? He says, yeah, everything. And then when Isaiah says to him, he says, in a short period of time, Babylon is going to come. And they're going to destroy this place. And they're going to take all your treasure. And they're going to burn this temple to the, to the ground. I, I read this story and I think, you know, it's all about confidence. It's all about steadfastness. Because it's not over till it's over. So the word for you and me regarding who is God, God is one that we should be able to put our full confidence in. You could take your life and rest it in his hands and trust him that he is going to maneuver it in such a way that your life would be blessed. Even in the midst of the hardships that Israel was facing, that Judah was facing, God still showed himself to be the God who was able to deliver. And in the meantime, while God is working out his overarching purposes, he knows how to take care of you in the meantime. And so it should give you that confidence to put your head on a pillow and recognize who holds the future. That my anxiety about things that are going to come or not come are not going to be deterred simply because I think I have all this personal confidence or I put a hedge against everything. No, no, we do what we need to do. We work. We show up. We use our talents. We use our brains but we also recognize that all of this needs the breath of God to blow on it for it to be blessed. I want to make sure that my relationship with him is secure because then I have peace because I know the prince of peace. So where does your confidence lie? 
That's a question that only you can answer. I hope by looking at today's story, you'd recognize times may change, but God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And all he's looking for is a people who demonstrate in word and in deed that they love him with their hearts, mind, soul, and strength, and that they love their neighbor as themselves. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for these stories. They're, they're taken in context of real life. There's war, there's devastation, there's hardship. There's a lot of pain and anguish, much of which was caused, Lord, by our own rebellions. And yet you intervene. You bring a righteous judgment, but you also bring a promise of hope. I, I pray for all of us who are listening today that our strength would be strengthened, that our resolve to follow you would be greatly established. And as always, we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen.